that go all right with you? Everything all right? That's real good, don't you think? Yeah, I like it. I like it. <laughs> Uh, all right, I'll do, we'll move right along. Um, in fact, uh, board, board comments made by the president. We also want some there. Um, and you know, I did decide to do Dawn is just type them out last time. I mean, when I did look at that tape, I noticed I just ran home, so I'm not going to do it. Um, Misha board commission, commi commissioners have been told by executive director Dale McCormick we control Misha by means of the rules of the budget. Um, we do, in fact, set some of the rules that do improve the overall budget. The problem is that it's unique to this board, however, versus any other state uh, board and agency uh, that fails to follow the rules. We have little as a board we can do. We can set new rules. We can set rules for Section 8 housing. But if, as it has happened, 40% inspection fail or failure rates exist with affordable conditions for four years, we have absolutely no power to do anything about it that year. Likewise, if costs per affordable housing units approach $300,000, as they have, or if questionable donations are made, or if management fails to share with us legally important and important critical letters such as from HUD and CHO, uh, that's the Elm Terrace letter, we have no recourse. Information regarding weatherization was requested by this board in August, from August to December before we received it. Complete QAP score results likewise took weeks, weeks to obtain. I am presently waiting for copies of RFPs, contracts for the weatherization and evaluations. Most importantly, information that is integral to the issues we are working on, such as unit costs and no way HUD debacle, are not presented to the board, especially if the information is highly critical of Misha. Board members have found out that about documents described above from other sources with interest in the portable housing industry, I have no doubt that we never would have seen that Elm Terrace letter and possibly that HUD letter as well if we did not discover their existence on our own. We complain, but we are told it's okay, that's fine, what would you like us to do now? The result, of course, is that there's no accountability. We can insist on new rules, but if they're not followed, our only option is to complain or to write yet more rules. Yes, once a year we can vote on a new budget or we can vote against the budget, but that's it, all that is is a nuclear option. There's no, there's no way to run an organization, and we're not going to do that, let alone address individual problems. Uh, later in the agenda, we're going to look at the uh, weatherization and carbon exchange computer costs. Uh, that'll be late in the agenda, unfortunately. Those costs are approximately $6 million. Where 95% of that money has gone to just a couple of contractors, JAI Associates, uh, Kenny Consulting, the International. We need to determine how much money has gone to carbon credits, because that market's collapsed. Uh, did we should anticipate the huge cost for lie heat weatherization and carbon trading software? I mean, did we know when we started this that we're going to be going in down a $6 million road? The Department of Energy provides much of this software for free. We could have got it for free. With the RFPs and where are the RFPs and contracts going to work? I hope there was some. We also need to know how the reported $779,000 in education was spent in 2010. Since a lot of those uh, education expenses were listed at Round Round restaurants or Victory Cafe or travel. They don't seem like education expenses. It's also two or three times as much as it was in the past. The director said, I think on TV, that uh, we had extra money. So that's what we used it for. Did the board approve spending 779000 on education, especially when you consider that 180000 was spent on travel expenses? Should, if you look at the education expenses, should they be merged together? Would they properly classify? Advertising and marketing is another one we, the board, is having a real difficult time understanding when we look at a lot of these uh, historical loans. 300000 for instance, was spent in one single year. How do you spend $300,000? You have oversubscribed and waiting lists on advertising. Why? We spend $750,000 a year for this building. Why then do we have so many meetings and beds and breakfasts and hotels? Why would we spend that extra money to go to beds and breakfasts in Maine and to hotels in Maine when we can have the meetings right here? Our executive director and others tell us that Opega will look into these matters. In truth, Opega presently has a very narrow focus. I think the audit committee talked about this, but they're really only looking at a few things. The more interesting thing that I looked at is after uh, Opega um, investigated the turnpike, 
Turnpike Authority and others came out and said, well, that vindicates us, everything is fine. And it, there really wasn't much in that Omega uh, uh, report. In fact, they actually did say that most, that most of the things were done properly. It was only later when they really dug into it that they found that it was not. So I'm not sure that, that we can wait for that <clears throat> as, as being some sort. We have to get information. As a board, we need to determine with the large concentrations of time and many millions of dollars spent on carbon trading, business, travel, consultants, and entertainment have contributed to the many problems the agency is now facing. Last month, the Secretary of PUD, Sean Donovan, wrote in a letter to Senate Collins, the egregious violations of PUD standards in Section 8 housing in, in, in Oxford County. Well, a second letter from HUD demanded a response within five days. It was even more descriptive. Uh, just get the existence of both those with this kind of from other sources. With this four years outrage and skyrocketing cost of historic housing been allowed to permeate for years, if more of our extremely competent staff is allowed to allocate their resources to our mission rather than the social issues, carbon trading, and other non uh, mission related issues. As board members, we are responsible for the actions of this agency. We need to have access to this all pertinent information. We need it in a timely manner. We need the critical information, not just the good information. We will address this in the audit section of the agenda. In the meantime, we must also assure that Misha's resources are efficiently employed in our mission and only our mission. It just should be said that so many of us on this board, I mean, we get criticized for like going after Misha for how they spend their money. We deeply, firmly, absolutely believe that you could serve so many more people. I mean, 770, you have extra money to spend $779,000 on education and restaurants, hotels, bed and breakfast. What about the lighting? I mean, all that money, all that, where we talk about people will die, I believe was the quote. We could have put more money into that. We could have put more money, we have millions of dollars in a computer system, six million dollars. What could we have done on, uh, for more projects for more people, to serve more people? I know, Don, when I talked to you one time, I mean, I really admired how you, you kept your unit cost down to 100000 how you, how you operated like a business. And that's, I guess my question, Dale, would be, is, is couldn't we serve so much more people? Why would we get extra money put in into education and, and meetings and expensive computer systems and a carbon trading system when the Y heat was cut and when you know, people are on waiting lists. It, it just, I, I'm at a loss. Um, we are, a lot of us are at the end of our role, but the audit committee will talk about it. Um, yeah. Thank you. First of all, it's important to understand there's an operating budget and there's a program budget. The program budget is pretty much what's uh, Congress appropriates. So for LIHEAP, they appropriate a certain amount each year. For Section 8, the rental assistance, they appropriate a certain amount each year. Um, the operating budget, how we deliver those programs, is separate from the program budget. So it's really a question of spending the money on operations or not spending it at all. We would want to be really very careful about spending operating funds on programs. Uh, if a diversion of our operating funds were made, uh, it should be rare, it should be very considered, the board should consider it, it should be part of a process, or else, Did the, board or else the, the fiscal um, health of the organization would be in jeopardy. Well, if you had extra money, did the board consider that? We were used to, I mean, your education funds were two, three hundred thousand. In, the, in the education area, um, I think what you'll find when you look at the numbers is that the internal, the, there's two kinds. There's programmatic education of partners, light heat, uh, frontline workers, Section 8 agents, and then there's the internal education of the staff to stay current on all the changes in the programs we deliver the IRS rules. Um, during my tenure, the internal education uh, amounts have decreased. What's increased, and it's been all since 2010, is the programmatic education, and that's due to, to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act and its requirements. For instance, in weatherization, which we got, I think, 42 million 
uh, they doubled from 10% Congress did to 20% the amount of training and technical assistance money that they gave to the states. So when you have extra money though, you, you were quoted as saying you put it in education or we have a lot of money we put in. I, I didn't say anything about extra money. Okay. I said that our yes, funds are separate and that our internal training uh, expenditures have decreased in my tenure and what's increased is what Congress appropriated for training. With all due respect, with all due respect, um, you said that you allocated excess money to either the gift card purchases oh. or with all due respect. That's a different sorry, that's a different question. So what's your question? My question is to follow up this and I'll go back to that. Is the seven hundred and seventy nine thousand dollars in education in two thousand ten? You're saying some was in the program budget, some was in the operating budget. The program budget has to be trained specific for programs. In the operating budget, the training is used for what? In the operating budget is our expenses here. Now I'm saying that. What, is, what is the educational component oh, in the operating budget? Training for? training section eight. Um, uh, our, our staff on uh, the software and new uh, requirements of HUD, which is constantly changing, training, going to keeping current on IRS rules, keeping current on why would, that be in of, the, why would that be in the HUD program budget? The, the programmatic expense from HUD, what I mean by that is the Section 8 payments to landlords. So, so part of the training for the Section 8 program is in the program budget, part of the training for the Section 8 program is in the operating budget. I think I'll ask, um, Darren, can you help the, uh, the treasurer understand our... Well, how can you speak to the 2010 uh, training issues? If you look at the payment register, it shows about seven hundred some odd thousand dollars of training expenses. About 262000 went to our operating budget, which was for a training of staff to keep current with uh, training issues. About 500000 was for training weatherization to energy auditors, which was part of the, uh, uh, the arm of the stimulus money, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act money. So what Dale was referring to is that we have programmatic training, uh, which is part of a federal program that we have, and then we have this training for the staff. And those are the those are the components of the seven hundred thousand dollars roughly that appears. Okay, well that's thank you. That, that's not what the executive director said. The executive director said that part of the training for the section eight work was coming out of the operating budget, but you, you made that clear. Thank you. So my next question would be of the two hundred and sixty two thousand dollars in two thousand ten that was in the operating budget, what was that used for? Oh, oh a variety of training to keep current with uh, you know, lending practices that change. I mean, we have to go out and whether it be a low income housing tax credit training for staff, uh, you know, an assortment of training requirements. Uh, they're either mandated by the federal government or to keep current with the changes with their program. Was, uh, all, was all of this in the 262 for the operating budget training yeah. and roughly $500 million, <coughs> excuse me, for the programmatic training? Yeah. Was all of that $780,000, all that training down on campus here at, at our facility? Oh, absolutely not. No. I, I would say the majority of it was not done here. You know, the one we go out and, for example, uh, the National uh, Housing Finance Agency Council, you know, which we're a member of, they provide training and all sorts of uh, things. We travel to Washington, perhaps. Uh, the training for the program, energy auditors training, that was done at various locations in the state of Maine. But uh, no, to answer your question, was it all done here? I would say very little of it. Maybe it would be helpful if we got, I'm sure we'll push the button there and you can give us a list uh, of all the expenses for the, um, the $500 in program training yeah. and a list of, of, of all the items in the, uh, the $262,000 operating budget training for 2010 to give the board more comfort to see how we're spending this money, where we're going, 
And for what purpose? I have a question about that too, but Sherry has been patiently waiting for you to share. I just want to look at my left. Can't cover. I've heard that about you once. Little said that. It was a little bit. It was Mark. I would have said it if I didn't squish it. I just wanted to say I have no real knowledge of 700 to 79,000, nor do I have a huge need to know, but in the world of training, I do know that there is training that goes to all parts of the state for simple things like realtors to learn what the programs are. And they're not going to come here to learn if they're outside Bangor somewhere because they don't care that much. They'd like to care, but they don't. I know a lot of it went toward um, the era of money because we had more discussions about blower doors and I can talk to you at Nazi about lower doors at any at a moment's way. Yeah, yeah. So I I can sure that we can have those conversations. I know that if a lot of spending went to not only get the various caps on board with it, to get the various workers who were suddenly going into people's homes trying to help them to make sure that they knew exactly what they were gonna do. I know we spent money on our people that we were trying to help with their mortgages um, so that they knew that that was a new program out there that we could give them four months um, to try and get back on their feet to go a very successful program um, that the arts office is overseeing and uh, you've done a great job with it so um, um, it's the sort of thing that but without getting the word out of that people wouldn't know and they just be throwing their keys back into their bags um, so a lot of these little things as different pots of money came to us. We would hear about the different things that, guess what, we have X amount of money from the federal government. I think we can now do this to help people with it. And I know that that's where some of that training went. And so I know we had discussions around the board um, as to what some of these funds were going to be. So I'm pretty pleased with it, and I'm pretty sure the magic hit of the button will give more than enough good information. Dan, when are you going to be able to get this data to the board? Break out for the training? Sure. Uh, we can get it. Today's Tuesday. Well, we'll like <laughs> Tomorrow. Yeah, right, right. That just we'll we'll Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Uh, Tomorrow. I'll go first and then you can go. But that leads into what our big problem has been right along. It's not something we ask for things, and it's, it's really hard for us. But I think with this audit committee, and the audit committee is happy with Linda Broad, I, I think what we can do, and uh, I know I've talked to a couple of you about the number of you about this. If we could get specific questions for you, we'll make you a list of exactly what we're looking at. I mean, for the life of me, I can't understand going to a bed and breakfast, you know, all over, you know, fancy ones all over Maine for these meetings. I'm sorry, but I just don't get it. We're, you know, the rest of the world's in a recession, supposedly the worst one since the Depression, and we're going to bed and breakfast. We're spending $779,000 a massive amount of money to spend. The computers and the $250 a year for carbon consulting, I just can't for the life of me understand. In any case, we'll make some specific questions. I guess what we're saying, almost in a way, we're done messing around. We want to know where the money's being spent. When I look at education, I see the ground round restaurant. I can't figure that out to save my life. I mean, that's two miles up the road. That's amazing. Well, that's what I mean. That's what's we can go through these one by one per day, but I think it would be better if we had a list. We get it to you, Darren. I trust you implicitly to tell us what it is, and uh, we start running through it. Um, I think I'm sorry. Well, me. I could talk about that. I probably will later. But I, I wanted to loop back around to something that you said. This difference between uh, the programs that we run and the operating costs. If I if I understood meetings that we've been at before, when this federal money comes to us, we skim a portion off the top. I may have the numbers wrong, but I wrote down on my piece of paper 10% we take off of the light heat program. I'm not sure if that's the number, but let's just go with it for fun. <laughs> if, if It seems to me that if we're talking about providing for folks in need, and we have more operating funds than we need, right. and we're using them, I hate to say it, but almost trying to find places to use the money, 
why don't we take less money off the top of these programs and use it for the purposes in which it's intended? And again, I don't know if 10% is a lightning number, but if it's 10% and we're running an operating surplus, why don't we take 8% or 7% or some other number so that more money actually goes out to the people using it? I mean, it seems to me, and I'll admit, at least for some of us, we're pretty new at this and we don't know a lot of the history, but it seems like we shouldn't be making anything on the operations. That should be as close to as zero as we could possibly make it. And if that means that we can find ways to reduce our expenses and put more into benefit dollars, that's what I think we should be doing. So I, I, I just, I'm nervous about a conversation that says, well, these are the programs we run and, and this is our operating budget and we keep them all separate. Well, I guess we do, unless we can take less for running the programs and put it into people's pockets that need it. And I just wanted to make sure I was clear that that's how I look at it. We should not be running an operating budget that has a big surplus on the bottom line and looking for ways to spend it. Let's put it into people's hands who need it. And let's be as efficient as we can. If I may, for, for LIHEAP as a good example, we administer the LIHEAP program for Congress, for DHHS. We are allocated a certain amount. Uh, they require that the administrative costs of running that program be less than 10%. For LIHEAP, we split it. We take 3.5% to do all the centralized things we do here and the quality control and getting the money out to the fuel dealers, and the CAPs get 6.5% in order to deliver the program. In most years, when the program is funded at a small amount, uh, that is not enough to run that program. So the caps end up putting money into, uh, up from other sources to run by you. And we, uh, if we have administered, we run our part on that 3.5%. We, we, it's, it's fiscal discipline, we, we run that. And if we have money left over in admin in that 3.5%, which we, have at some point when there has been a large amount funded by Congress that goes into benefits. And I guess what but I'm saying, and I appreciate that, but if we're, raising, but if we're running, if we're running this operation at a profit, maybe we should take it to zero. Well, the question you're raising, though, is the, the operations budget of the larger entity, the bank. And I think that's a slippery slope to backfill a congressional decision um, what you and, told me is Congress said you board, can't take more of this. I would want the board to make that decision. I'm sure you do. But what you said is that Cong Congress said you can't take more than a certain amount. They didn't say you couldn't take zero. And I'm just using that as an example. But I responded to you that when we do it for less, we put that extra admin into benefits. But you still take 3.5%. No. You no. take zero. No. Maybe one year we did it for 2.5%. We funded our and what I'm saying is, I, I just, want, and I, I just what I'm saying is, if, if we have surplus in our operating budget, then we, then we should we should not take anything out of this program. We should ah, take zero. I see what you're and every you know, if we've got an extra you know three hundred thousand dollars that we're trying to find a place to burn, place to burn uh, let's take zero for a program and let's put three hundred thousand dollars into the heat program. We don't need the money. And, okay. and I'm not saying the budget works this way every year. I don't know, but I just want to be very clear that in my mind. We're trying to run a lean operation, and every penny that we don't have to extort out of some federal program to run it is another penny that can go to the benefit that, that program is trying to provide. Well, that, that's just the way I explain it. is quite a word, but okay. let me well, just say that The other thought this, was theft, but I didn't want to use that. <laughs> well, another thought is the cost of running the program. But let me clarify that we get two funding <laughs> sources from the a state government. One is the real estate transfer tax that funds the home fund. And we take no admin of that. We pay for that out of our operating budget. And the other is the shelter operating fund. And we also take no admin of that. So our operating budget is doing exactly what you are saying for the people of Maine. But we're still running a profit. Yeah. You know, yes, we Excuse want me. to run a profit. But, but our, frustration, this, our, our frustration with this whole thing, and I'm sorry for a second, you yeah. One second. It's just that when we look at three hundred thousand dollars for advertising, I don't understand what we need to spend three hundred thousand dollars in advertising in a given year. We look at tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands on bed and breakfast. Let me finish. When we spend 
800,000 in education and millions of dollars on a computer system that we could have got for free. True, there's some grants, but then there's $250,000 against selling fees. If we could take that money, I mean, who can stop us from taking that money and giving it to poor people who need heating fuel? Who can stop us from giving it to people who need de uh, decent and safe housing that are on waiting lists? I mean, that's what we're talking about. That's, we look at those vast amounts of money that are being spent on these things, and we're not having the meetings here, we're having them someplace else. That's, we want to use that money the way the mission says it should be used, and that's what we should be doing. And we, when we get the information from Darren, which now we're going to insist upon, we're going to find out how we can do that. Bruce? And the advertising budget has come down. Yeah, asking about but for yeah, years, it's only the last year or two, but for four or five years, it's been, you know, it's been sitting at 253. We have brought more and more in house in order to conserve right, funds, and we're doing it for much less than Sorry. we used to. Yeah. What is a carbon credit exchange program? What is that? Yeah. The uh, program uh, to create a methodology in order to sell the carbon credits. The, car the emission reductions of carbon that we get every time we weatherize a home. We get 1.8, say 1.8 tons of carbon. In order to save that and have investors pay us for that, we created a methodology. We reg registered it with the voluntary, the verified carbon standard. And we are now in the process of having a third party verifier verify what those carbon savings were so that we can sell it. Now you talk about how much the carbon project has cost. It has not cost millions. It has cost one, about one million dollars. And that, in the sale of just the carbon for that project, we will make 4.5 million dollars. It is a good investment. I'll maintain that it's a good investment. And we did it to supplement the money that comes from the federal government for weatherization, which is never enough, it's entrepreneurial. I would think you would approve of it. We're saving taxpayer dollars with that program. Okay, let me hear Matt. Let me try and answer this. When I'm questioning the numbers, go ahead, because I've been reading the law. Go ahead. When, when the Housing Authority <coughs> pays for would taxpayer dollars, the weatherization of a home, then is it, it is my understanding, correct me if I'm mistaken, that we ask or insist, I don't know what the, what the question is, or what the, uh, how we do this, but we either ask or insist that the homeowners sign off to Main State Housing their carbon credits. Is that correct? We request. We request. So that's a very important question. Is that illegal? Can we we can only request it, we can't require it. Um, that's a question of policy. We have been asking, we have not been requiring because. Can you legally require it? I think we could legally it. require it. They're getting a benefit of about $6,500 from the federal yeah. government. And what we're doing with the sale of the carbon, carbon credits is offsetting this taxpayer dollars that go into that. Because we've had, we've had people say to us that you are not, um, that there's a lot of high pressure, the cap agencies are telling us there's tons of high pressure to, to get those uh, those credits signed over, and that they had the feeling that it was not, uh, in other words, that was a monetary value to those people. Well, certainly the money came, and at least came from the federal government, not from Misha. And we're requiring that they turn it over to us. We're, we're strongly requesting it. Is that right? And then, and then one other thing, as far as a venture and entrepreneurial, ordinarily you do think entrepreneurial is great, but not for a housing authority. I don't want it to be in a venture capital or a housing, in a business if I'm in a housing authority. I want to make real conservative. I mean, carbon credits, when I looked at all those models that you have, and I went through every one of them, the price is about 10% of what it, in fact, less than that, 5% of what it is on the high end, and way less than half of what it is on the low end. And there is no way in the world that thing is making any money. Cal Gorgon out of the business, the Chicago Carbon Trade Exchange collapsed. It, it's very unlikely. Anyway, go ahead. Is Linda Gould here today? She is not. I'm here for her. Bob, right? John, John, I think you're part of it. That's right. We don't have a lot of staff, and I have 140 of you, but 
Um, what I would request, I'd like to add to the list of questions, John, could you give us a, a legal determination if the Maine Housing Authority is able to uh, request um, uh, these carbon credits from the homes that we weatherize? Okay. If I'm going to require, what require? Both. But we, yeah, yeah. Yeah. we, we do you. require, on the multifamily side, we require the developers to sign over those credits. So it's mandatory? I mean, it's a it's mandatory as part of the big uh, closing package. Uh, you know, it's one document out of you know, three inches of document. Oh, we still but it's mandatory. Yes. Okay. So we're taking federal money to weatherize homes, and then we are. We well, in in this case, in multifamily, no. It's main. It's a loan from main housing. It's the multifamily <coughs> home energy loan. Okay, how about if it's not multifamily? Are we still, is it still mandatory to turn over these credits to us? I don't know. No. Know. He can answer it, ha it has not to been to date. It has not been. Okay, well, John, it'd be great if you give us a legal opinion to the board of, 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 of uh, what we have been doing and if it's, if it's within, the, uh, within the regulation. Second of all, what is the, is the average amount, of dollar amount of, the, of these carbon credits in the $200 to $300 range? Do I have that right? Question. Is the average amount of these the value of these of these carbon credits in the two to three hundred dollar eighty nine? It's a dollar eighty nine. Dollar eighty nine. Oh, contraire, not for Retire. what we sold them for. That's what you're That's what it is to today. Here, if I may, what you're referring to is a Reggie credit and a Reggie, right. which stands for the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative here in Maine. Right. Um, that that market is very low. It's oversubscribed. They issued more credits than there was a market for. Where we're selling uh, these emission reductions um, are into the voluntary carbon market, and our price is much higher than that. Now, my question is, when we go and we weatherize a home, and we're either mandating they turn over the credits to us or asking if they will, what is the average value of those credits that we turn over in the house? Two to three hundred dollars? Did I hear that number at some point? Well, first of all, I, I've said three times that we are not requiring those credits. So I'd appreciate it if you reflect that in your remarks. Secondly, the value of those credits uh, depends on the price of carbon in the voluntary carbon market. Uh, so, for instance, if the price were $10, which I think is approximately where the carbon market is now, 7 to $10 for a ton, then the value to that homeowner uh, is $20 a year. The issue for the homeowner is that they cannot sell those credits. It takes the kind of work we did in this pilot project to create the documents and the platform on which a, a ton of carbon becomes an investment instrument that can be sold and traded. Okay, seven to ten. So it's only valuable in its aggregate. Seven to ten dollars per ton. How many tons would come out of a? One point eight tons per year. And so how many years? Twenty to twenty-five years, up to thirty. But okay, we're, so we're these, being conservative so and counting twenty years. So given today's price in the carbon market, that these uh, uh, these these credits that are being turned over to Maine State Housing Authority are in the neighborhood of four to six hundred dollars per house, roughly. Yes, and we believe that's about 11 percent of the cost of a weather station. Where are you getting offsets? that? I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I guess I'm getting different prices. We're taking a middle price of carbon. <coughs> and the last time you DOE. sold carbon? Have you sold any credits in the last couple of months? No, we're about to. Okay, and when I go to uh, the regional gas, it's very exciting. gas initiative, and it's a dollar eighty-nine a ton. And I see that everybody else has got out of the business. I mean, I see the outdoors because collapsing. Because we have a buyer. Stand we have what a I'm contract. getting at is why would you get nine, seven to ten dollars a ton when they're selling it in open auctions for a dollar eighty nine a ton? Because they're two different markets. Those are stupid but people who are the smart people. I don't understand. What is it? You know, either, really, I'm having the, trouble understanding why. The Reggie market is a closed market. They're the only people who trade in that market are utilities. The voluntary right. carbon market is worldwide, and there's many people who trade there. There's also a European trading scheme market where carbon is $22, $25, $30 a ton. When was the last time we sold carbon credits? Uh, 
Prince. We have contracted with Chevrolet right, to uh, deliver all the carbon that we can produce up to 2015, and we will be delivering that soon. So, have we sold anything and received any cash yet? No. Nope. Okay. But soon. Peter. Like in the next so, week. We discussed this a little bit at the December 20th meeting. 